Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices to Creating and Managing a Modern Records Management Program. I'm Teresa Resick, Director here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's events. And with me today are Mark Diamond of Contoro and Jen Farnham of Access. And Access is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. So as we get started, just want to offer a few pointers. Uh, by joining the webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. And across the bottom of the screen are the list of all of the options that are available to you in that widget list. To you, so just click on that uh, from the list. And uh, with that, you'll be able to text chat with each other and also with a few of us from here at AIM. Do ask questions to the speakers throughout our time using the Q&A feature, and we will hold them until the end. And you can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You may download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right of the slide area. And there's also a number of other documents and links in there to help you learn more about what we're going to be chatting about today. So click in there at any time. That resource will open in a new browser tab, and you can save it and read it after the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, but it also in that is in that list of widgets below the slide area. And I would greatly appreciate it if you would take a few moments um, to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. And this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. And now I'd like to introduce the, our speakers that we have with us today. Uh, Mark Diamond is the founder and CEO of Contoral. And Mark is a recognized industry thought leader in proactive records and information management, litigation readiness, and risk and compliance strategies. And as trusted advisors, Mark and his company Contoral help bridge legal, compliance, security, and business needs and policies with effective processes, technology, and change management. And we also have with us today Jen Farnham, and she's an Information Governance Regional Executive with Access. And Jen is an industry leader in information governance and data compliance with over 13 years of experience in client success account management for some of the largest companies and government agencies in California. So right now as we begin today, I'm going to turn things over to Mark Diamond to begin our talk. Mark? Thank you very much, Teresa. I appreciate that. Um, we want to talk a little bit today about how to make a more modern, effective, compliant records retention schedule and program, something that will actually work. And, and I talk to a lot of organizations, a lot of people. and we see a lot of organizations, quite frankly, um, the records retention program is sort of out there, but it's not quite working. And we want to look at some of the root causes of why that's happening and how that is affecting different organizations. And <clears throat> one of the issues we find out there is that a lot of organizations are stuck in what we call traditional record schedules. Um, and we see this when we know this. And it, essentially, Many records retention schedules today tend to be very paper-centric. They tend to be, you know, um, really focused on the day when, when somebody manually handled a, a record via paper, they took the paper, they put it in a box, and we realize that, you know, paper isn't going away, and there's still a lot of paper out there. But what we do see is that the vast majority of information today comes in electronic format. And, and quite frankly, the paper-centric model just doesn't work or it doesn't work very well in an era of electronic documents. The next problem we see is a lot of these programs tend to be what we call big R focused. Um, clearly, records retention programs and records retention schedules need to address legal and regulatory requirements. There are rules out there, there are laws out there on what you need to save and how long you need to be able to save it. Um, however, if it only focuses exclusively on the legal component of it, that creates a gap because quite frankly, um, much of the information an organization have also has business value. And if the records retention program doesn't recognize business value as one of the key drivers, as one of the key classifications for record type, um, we find, tend to find that those processes sort of stall out. We also see a lot of schedules really lack a consensus with the business. 
Um, we believe that a good policy and schedule is something that not only details what you need to do, but it represents the creation and, and implementation of that as an agreement. Here's what we want to save. Here's what we don't want to save. And uh, here's how long we're going to keep the stuff that we do want to save. Too often we see these policies sort of created in a conference room, if you will, and then foisted on the employees or the business units without a lot of feedback from the business units, without a lot of feedback from employees. And by the way, this is also related to the first one because, well, that, you know, we, we see these comments all the time. You know, that, that doesn't reflect my, my documents or my records or what's out there. And so, you know, you may, organizations may have the, the, the authority to dictate what's in a policy and schedule. But effective programs tend to be much more consensus oriented. And, and the net result is we actually find that the compliance with records programs, how well it is identifying records, making sure that those records are, are maintained um, and retained, uh, deleting those records when out there, we find a big gap between what the policies say, the schedules say, and what companies are actually doing, and quite frankly, a gap with regulatory compliance because they're not following the policy. And this creates a lot of risk and need discovery, it costs costs and other problems out there. And so part of what we're saying today is part of what makes a, a records program effective is taking a step back. We've seen a lot of organizations over the last four or five years, we work about 30% of the Fortune 500, we've seen them sort of rethink what they're doing for a records program and quite frankly, rethinking what they're doing for a record schedule. Um, so some of the drivers, you know, what we think that it's, important in some of the drivers is there are new legal and regulatory requirements. There are always new legal and regulatory requirements coming out there. And so in the newer approach, clearly as a baseline, we always have to keep up to date on the legal and regulatory requirements. But also we want to switch more of the format to electronic media. I can't tell you how many records retention schedules we've seen that classify email, for example, as a record. Email in of itself is not a record. Email is a media type. Media, uh, email has some records some which exist exclusively in records and many that are not. We see the same thing with other types of media out there. And so a big change on what's going for an effective program is to switch to electronic media. The other thing that's becoming increasingly important, and we could talk a long time about this, what we won't, is it's really important for a modern program to fit into other governance frameworks. Um, whether it's GDPR privacy, or this will be a huge issue coming up, and if you're not aware of it, get this on your radar, California Consumer Privacy Act and the other states that are likely to act legislation, but also legal hold processes, e-discovery. Um, there are a number of other compliance paradigms. And to be honest, a lot of the old-fashioned records programs don't play well. A good, modern, and effective program does play well with these modern frameworks, and they, they work with privacy programs. They work with e-discovery. Um, they assist in IT to be able to do that. And so... Again, as, as we talked about, a lot of the current approaches that we see are not working. Therefore, we've seen really across all, all industries, whether it's financial services or manufacturing or life sciences or transportation or manufacturing, I mean, the list goes on and on. We're seeing organizations that are rethinking their records program, rethinking about what they're doing, rethinking their schedules, in part to make it much more effective. When we talk about records maturity, we like to talk about different levels and have some of these categories. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to go through every single category today, but it's useful to talk about what's the maturity that you need. And when we talk about a records retention schedule maturity model, which this is, we want to look at these key factors, which is are you compliant, um, which is entirely no, but that's an important factor. Is it comprehensive? Does your schedule you know, address all media out there? Is it clear? Can somebody understand it? Um, does it represent a consensus? Is it something that's usable? Is it something that's integrated? Um, and likewise, does your records retention schedule lend itself to defensibility? And is it something you can maintain? And so again, this is sort of the big picture step back. <clears throat> Traditionally, most programs have looked only at the first one, which is legal and regulatory compliance, which is good. I mean, that's important. I don't want to diminish the importance of that. But it's more than that, and that's what's in part driving organizations to take a slightly bigger picture view of what's out there. So let me touch on a few of these drivers out here. Um, the first one is comprehensive. Have you identified all the records out there? Um, the tendency sometimes in an immature program is just to 
to identify, well, what are the typical records in our industry, um, but not quite even, frankly, the, the records that you may have. We find that good programs um, at a limited basis um, have a list of what they have. They're, they're wide reaching. They have all different record types. And this is important. I would say that 80 to 90% of the records that go in most records retention schedules, I'm going to classify as really easy. Um, HR records, finance records, I mean, I mean, those are pretty common. It's interesting, organizations have it oftentimes, um, uh, if not specific, sometimes even unique record requirements, whether it's uh, the 10 or 20%. This could be certain information types. It could be certain record types. It could be, you know, if you're life sciences, we've seen tissue samples as a record. Um, in uh, oil and gas, we've seen core samples of records. These really provide interesting information. We one time did a lot of work for a, uh, uh, an athletic shoe manufacturer, and they would save shoes as records because these shoes had a huge amount of intellectual property. The point I'm trying to make, whether it's digital or a physical record, i.e. non paper, but an actual item that you're scoring as a record, oftentimes capturing this extra 20% of the, the specific or unique records to your are incredibly important. And, and when it comes to either litigation or IP management or, quite frankly, um, other types of compliance, this full comprehensive set of records is really important. And, you know, the, there's this one trend out there going saying, well, we're just going to spit out a list of records from a computer. No, find out what information you have. Find out what's out there. Find out how people are using it. Another important part of a good records retention schedule is have you looked at all the media? Um, again, we find very immature schedules tend to only look at paper. Um, more mature is they look at all the different media and look at more important, they look at the content within the media. Um, what I alluded to earlier is email is a good test. You know, there are some records that live exclusively in email. I mean, we may not want to keep it to manage it in email. Maybe we want to put it into a system like Office 365 to be able to manage it better or SharePoint or something like that. But we also see the same principle being applied, whether it's social media or other record types out there. So look at all across the media. There's, again, there's this old-fashioned view. Well, I talked to somebody recently, say, we've got a great records program. You know, we've got all of our record types defined. And I asked them for what media, or well, for paper. Well, we haven't really looked at electronic. And, and my response is, well, electronic records are typically 80 to 90% of the records you have. So we say, isn't it important that you have a really comprehensive records retention schedule that's out there? Talked a little bit about this. We think another attribute of a modern schedule is there a consensus with the business unit. Um, have we identified both the legal and regulatory records plus the business value records out there. Um, oftentimes we see a worst case immature scenario is, you know, legal will create a policy. They will use that as a big stick to tell other people to get rid of their stuff. And even though these organizations have the, the ability to do that, those types of approaches usually flop and sometimes even backfire where people will do things like underground archiving and other things like that. A more mature approach is identify all the records uh, key, with key stakeholders, get business units in alignment, um, really try and suss out where do we have our business value and no, don't. By the way, there's a fear sometimes of saying that if we only look at, if we look at both legal as well as business value, our users are going to say, oh, we need to save everything forever. So that's why we've defaulted to only looking at uh, legal and regulatory retention requirements. And we push back on that a little bit. We say the art of building a good records retention schedule is being able to suss out, being identifying, being able to clearly show this is the legal and regulatory requirements. This is the stuff we want to keep because it has value, which by extension means that there's all the rest of the stuff, all the rest of the records that we can get rid of. Um, and people, this, this is lost on people sometimes. Sometimes people feel like if I have a slightly more comprehensive schedule, I won't be able to delete. What we see is if you can build consensus in your schedule, that makes the downstream disposition process much, much easier. Um, but again, to do that, we think you need to have a, a fairly mature schedule as part of the process. Um, is it integrated? So we have a different maturity here on what a schedule is, is, is it integrated? And again, if it's standalone, um, we're seeing most organizations sort of scrap this idea of a completely standalone 
um, records program. Matter of fact, I was just in a meeting, an executive meeting this morning where we talked about this uh, with the client with these exact issues. Good records programs obviously address records management, um, but they will work with e-discovery. They will work with privacy, the GDPR or, or U.S. privacy requirements. They'll really focus on knowledge management and collaboration. Um, increasingly, by the way, this is why we're seeing organizations migrate their records program to a larger information governance program. This, this ability to work with others adds value to a records program. A good records program can be a significant boon. It can be of real assistance to a privacy program. Matter of fact, if you look at GDPR or uh, California Consumer Privacy Act requirements, um, there's requirements there on, on, on integrating with a records program um, to be able to identify what you have to save or what you don't have to save. Um, and then, and again, a more proactive and enabling is, is you know, it, it feeds, one feeds into another. And so um, uh, this is also true, by the way, for information security. We're seeing a lot of data security classification sensitive information. Whether that data security and sensitive information is in the records retention schedule itself or the data security classification policy works effectively with a, um, uh, the two policies sync up together, um, that's really clear. But again, the message here is the more mature program plays well with others, and we're not limited to that. The next area is, is, is it defensible, and it's interesting. This is probably one of the more important areas for a records program, um, but we would argue that this is also probably one of the weakest. Um, and, and again, I spent a good part of my week having these conversations with a number of different organizations. A policy or schedule in of itself does not make you compliant. Uh, we've seen organizations try and create these super detailed policies out there, um, somehow thinking that if they have this tremendous amount of detail, if they have citations for everything, that will make it compliant. In reality, compliance from the view of the courts and the regulators, and this is both in the U.S. and Europe and other parts of the world, so especially, especially in Europe, um, is how well are you following your policy? Can you show this? What the courts want is, show me what, tell me what you said you're going to do. This is what your policy is. Our policy says we're going to do this. Tell me how you did it. What are the right pieces out there? Tools, processes, file plan, training. Um, and the final one, and this is the step that's most often overlooked, how did we check to make sure that we did it? Are people saving the records? Are we catching all the media types? Um, are we preserving these? Um, are we deleting what we're saying? There's sometimes a fear that if you check up and you find holes in your program, that that's going to create risk. Somehow if I acknowledge that my program's not perfect, that I'm going to create risk. It's actually the opposite. Regulators and courts appreciate the fact they realize that these are imperfect processes. They appreciate the fact that if you go back and update your policy and schedule and then check to see how it's doing and then make adjustments, maybe it's in your training, maybe it's in your processes, maybe it's even back to your schedule. Um, so you're consistent with how you execute your schedule. That's what has compliant. And, and, and I've talked about this in the past. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good, but make sure you're following what you're doing. That, that ability to, to to audit, to demonstrate, is really what gives you, in our view, defensibility. Um, we, here's what we said. We checked it up, and where we found gaps, we remediated that. And those gaps aren't creating risk. Identifying those gaps are not creating risk. They're, they're actually reducing risk. And so that ends up being a, really a difficult thing for organizations to get their arms around. Um, so I've touched on a, a few of the factors that we've seen out there. And, and just to summarize a little bit, and we're – um, touching on this, uh, 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 these, we see a real change. I, I work with many, many companies, many uh, public sector, private organizations. Um, we have a really good view on what organizations are doing, and especially within the last three years, we've really seen a wholesale change in terms of how organizations approach these records programs. And the fundamental issue, we think, is sort of rethinking the program. A lot of the traditional programs, quite frankly, aren't effective. And, you know, we say, hey, there's your problem. Sometimes it's, it starts with the basics. It starts with creating a, a modern, compliant, effective policy and schedule. But then having that schedule be able to, to impact other parts of the records program. So um, 
again, I, I one time had a manager that my first manager out of college told me that, you know, the biggest mistakes in projects are typically made in the first five minutes. Um, we make that same argument in records programs. Take a step back. Let's take a big picture view. What are we trying to do? What are the different pieces? What does it mean to be effective? What does it mean to be compliant? Dispel yourself of some of the old notions of, of what made a compliant records program, because as I alluded to, many of those are quite frankly wrong, and think about a new modern compliant and easier to execute records retention program. So um, with that, um, as if you've noticed, I've glossed over a significant amount of details on this. Um, take a look, uh, send an email at info at contoral.com and we'll be happy to send you a white paper that goes into much more detail. We actually have a tremendous amount of information, white papers, number of white papers, uh, recorded webinars, other information. Happy to share all that with you, but take a look. Send an email to info at contoral.com uh, we'll send you this white paper right back um, to be able to look at that. We'll give you more detail on what we're doing. And, 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 and let's say that we wish you success with the development of your records program. Good time to rethink it. And, and I'll just end. Those organizations that have sort of rethought it and restarted it and redone it with a more modern approach, um, those programs are creating much more traction. Um, they tend to be much more successful. And quite frankly, they get a lot more management support. Um, um, a lot more successful overall. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, turn it to our next spe speaker, Jen. Um, we've talked to us about some of the basic steps. Um, how do we get more modern on this? What do we do? On Hi, everybody. Um, I, I, everything that you've said has been spot on um, from what I've seen in the marketplace, and I work with clients all the time, um, just like you do. And we tend to hear the same thing, right? Everybody wants to get to this point, but nobody's really quite sure how to get there. So what I'm going to go over in the next 10 to 15 minutes is just what you want to look for when you're out there and you're starting to create either a focus group or an initiative in your company, what kind of company you want to work with um, when you're out there, maybe running those RFPs or just out there meeting with consultants, just trying to find out what characteristics you want to look for in a partner. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes here. When you're looking at solutions overall, what you really want to find is a company that can marry the consulting piece of it, and that's all of what Marcus talked about, but you also want to make sure that they have the technology solutions to make sure that you can actually manage everything and automate as much as you can. So having a total information governance platform is basically going to be a perfect combination of policies and procedures which are going to be dictated by your company and your legal team and then bringing in the technology to make sure that you can have a holistic solution that's going to basically marry the policy and the technology into a tangible solution for you. So that's really what you want to accomplish, and that's what you really want to have um, in a partner when you're looking to kind of put this into motion. Obviously, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle is going to be making sure that you can defensively reduce your content, and we often refer to that as ROD. It's redundant, obsolete, and trivial data. So a lot of what, you know, your IT teams are backing up and a lot of the data that you have is often redundant and obsolete, meaning that you don't even need to have it, and then on top of that, you've got multiple copies of it that keep backing up and you just keep creating more and more data. So when you start getting into the, the nuts and bolts of your information and your content, you often see that there's a lot of it that right off the bat can be reduced by deduping, and then you're left with an actual you know, set of data or metadata that you can start working on and start reducing and, and start enforcing governance upon. So that's a really big piece, and that's a very difficult piece, especially when it's electronic with the amount of data that's being produced on a daily basis. But that's really um, one of the most important parts of the process when you're looking to work with a vendor or a partner, making sure that they have the ability to go through and help you get rid of duplicates, you know, documents that you're keeping that aren't really identifiable records, expired records, and then just getting down to the actual subset that you really do need to enforce governance upon. Policies and procedures around that, obviously, you know, when you have it really nothing, like you might have a retention policy, but maybe you don't know what you're doing with it, or maybe it needs to be updated, or maybe there's gaps, or maybe you have a perfect policy, but you just don't know how to enforce it. Um, it's a little bit easier on the physical records, but it's very difficult when it comes to the electronic piece. So kind of what you want to look for is, is where do you need to start? 
maybe it's that needs assessment. Maybe it's just some consulting work just to take a look at what you currently have, identify gaps, identify maybe new laws and regulations that you're not pertinent to, and figuring out how that applies to your vertical. So that's usually step one. And you may have had that piece done already, and you just need to work on how to develop it or how to enforce it. Another piece of it is your vital records and your disaster planning. So often we forget about, you know, what happens if we have this great process and this great, you know, procedure in place, but something happens and we can't manage it because of a disaster. On top of that, to make it worse, you've got your litigation preparedness. And that's usually the, you know, <laughs> the worst case scenario, but you want to make sure that you have addressed that because you need to be prepared in the case that you are audited or you do have some litigation brought against you. And then going back to that gap assessment, that applies to both your policy and your procedure. So you may have a great policy, but you may have gaps in how you're enforcing them or vice versa. You may know how to enforce them, but you may need to get your policy updated. So it's really a combination of taking a look at what your policies are going to be and then what your procedures are going to be for making sure that you can enforce them and always have them automated going forward so that you're always covered. And like Mark mentioned, that you've got a legally defensible plan. That's the most important language that you want to focus on. And of course, it's the end-to-end -end implementation, right? You want to make sure that you've got it on your physical documents, but on your electronic documents as well, whether that be SharePoint, email, all of the stuff, whatever, whatever policies you've got in place with your company on the electronic data, that's what you want to be focusing on. And then you want to make sure that your employees are trained because it's great that legal might know or HR might know or your records manager might know, but it's your employees that are living and breathing these documents every day. So if there are important things that need to be declared as records, Obviously, automation would be the best way to do it, so you take the onus off of the individual employees, but if that's not an option at this point, you want to make sure that they understand what's required so that they can be a part of it and understand that their actions are going to have consequences if the data isn't you know, captured properly. So it's really important that you have legally sufficient policies and procedures and that everybody understands the importance of that so that you can build a strong foundation within your company and have a total information governance platform. So in summary, um, just everything that Mark has talked about and just kind of, you know, moving into what I've talked about, a good robust partner is going to have the products and services and expertise that you need to implement that legally defensible program that's modern, that's up to date, that has all the, you know, most current rules and regulations, any laws, whether it's HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley or any of those things that apply to your particular company. You want to make sure that all of that is incorporated, that everything is vetted by your legal team, and if they need assistance, make sure you bring in that consultant that is you know, the expert on that and can help you do that analysis identify any gaps and make sure that you've got the fullest, most robust policy that is going to keep you guys in the legally defensible realm and get you to that transformational level of information governance. In addition to that, they should have the services and the solutions to help you with that. So not only should they be able to bring a consultant, but they should also either have the services themselves or be able to work directly with a partner that they've already vetted so that they can work with you and you don't have to go to multiple different parties. You don't have to issue multiple different RFPs. What you want is that really streamlined process so you can, you know, hopefully work with one partner that can bring you all of the solutions and all of the consultant, you know, information that you need without you having to go to multiple different places. So obviously expertise with the consulting and records retention policies is an absolute must. They need to understand how to manage your records, and they need to understand what types of facilities and regulations around the physical and electronic data to make sure that you're secure and that everything is encrypted and that everything is going to be defensible if you, know, you are audited or if litigation is brought against you. And then, of course, you want it to be scalable because if you, you, know, you might be a little company that's starting out, but you're going to grow, and you want to make sure that as you grow, your partner can grow with you and that you don't have to switch to somebody else because now you're outside of the scope of what they can do. So whether you're large or small, you want to make sure that the partner that you're working with is going to be able to scale up and down with whatever your you know, roadmap is going to be and that they can also develop a roadmap that makes sense and make, you know, develop a budget that makes sense. So it's not going to be a difficult endeavor for you to get to that transformational level. Um, you want to make sure that you can work with somebody that understands your needs and requirements and can pretty much map their plan out with what you're looking to accomplish because you don't want to take on too much. It's already a difficult process to start with, and the last thing you want to do is have a partner that's going to ask you to do too much too quickly. So it's really important that you, know, you identify what you're looking to do and what time frame, and that they can basically map out their plan with what makes sense for you. 
Just a little bit about Access. Um, we were founded in 2004. We've got a ton of team members all over the world. We've got a lot of facilities. We've got a lot of clients. And we're one of the fastest growing companies for the last 10 years. So we have a lot of experience in this. I've been doing this for a little over 13 years. Um, information and governance is definitely the area that I've been focusing on. I think it's, it's very exciting. And we've been hearing this buzzword for so many years, but I finally feel like, you know, maybe in 2019, it's going to be the year that all of our clients start talking about it and start focusing on it more because now it is really a, a tangible goal. And it's something that is becoming more and more attainable with all the technology and all the different solutions that are coming out. So I think we're going to start to see more and more of a push and more and more of a focus with our different clients to try to get to that, you know, higher level of, of governance. We have a global presence, which is great. Um, I, I'm in the NorCal area, so I've got a lot of clients that are, you know, maybe headquartered here but have arms and legs all over the world. So it's very important to take a look at the different areas that you might be having offices in because there may be different regulations. You've got safe harbor in Europe and you've got, you know, Canadian issues where information can't cross you know, um, country lines. So it's very important that if you do have a global presence, that the partner you're working with also has a global presence and that they understand the different regulations in different markets because, of course, you're going to have to have different policies and procedures depending on what those regulations are on a country-specific basis. So it's very important to make sure that your partner has the same type of presence that you're looking for, that you're managing, because otherwise it's not going to make sense if they're only a U.S.-based company and you're not. So that's one of the things you want to take a look at. And then just um, a quick overview of access. We basically manage all of your, your document lifecycle needs. And um, we've got the shredding, we've got the storage, we've got the electronic storage, we've got conversion, and then we have the ability to get you the consulting and the, the governance piece of it. So um, I don't want to talk about us too much because this is more about you guys and, and what you can do to get your company there. But if you do have any questions, um, we certainly have been doing this for quite a while. So feel free to reach out. I know that, um, Therese is going to give you a little bit of information on how to reach out to us, but I think that overall, um, Mark, you did a great job, and I think it makes a lot of sense for what our customers are looking for in this time frame and what they're looking to do with their information governance focus groups and policies going forward. So with that, um, that is everything I had. Well, thank you, Jen. And um, as Jen mentioned, that there are some resources that uh, she and her colleagues are making available to you. There's an ebook and link to a blog, and they are in the resources section off to the right, so you can click on that now, and you can access that after the webinar, or when you download a PDF of the slides, you can certainly have uh, you know, be able to get to these links. And uh, I took a look at that ebook myself, and that's a really good paper in there. So I encourage you to uh, go and check that out. Um, and also the reminder that uh, Contoro offers some additional resources um, uh, in that resources list. There is the link to their website, but also, as Mark said, email them at info at contoral.com, and they'll send you um, that, uh, their white paper over as well. So a lot of great resources we have available for you immediately. Uh, and so I just do want to get to questions. A lot of questions have come in, and we're going to do our best to get to as many of them as we can. And Jen, I just want to start with a quick one for you because we all get kind of caught up in our alphabet soup sometimes. Uh, one of your slides um, mentioned ROT, um, R-O-T. Can you uh, define uh -huh. that for us? So that would be your re redundant, obsolete, and trivial data. Um, these are things that, you know, we've seen, <laughs> probably all of you experienced. Somebody sends out a, you know, menu because there is going to be a catering party on a Friday in your office, and now there's, you know, 2,800 copies of this menu that, you know, is not really a document. That's not something that is ever going to be brought up in court, but it's now being backed up repeatedly on a daily basis on multiple computers by your IT team. So it's creating a ton of you know, data that is not even something that you need to be backing up. So those are the types of things. I mean, that's just a funny example, but you can imagine, you know, Apple, you know, music and all those things that are, you know, potentially in your laptop that are being backed up because there might be a save all policy. You really want to get down to the metadata and make sure that what you're maintaining and what you're enforcing these regulations upon are actually vital records to the integrity of your company and that you're not just backing up everything because 
if it's there, it's going to be producible in court. And obviously a Chinese menu isn't going to, you know, cause any issues, but think of all the other document types that potentially should have been destroyed, but they weren't, you know, maybe mapped down to the specific data of that document. So there's no way for you to enforce any rules and regulations. Maybe it should have been destroyed 20 years ago, but it's still sitting there. So it's going to be producible in court. So that's just really what you want to accomplish is to get to the metadata of every document, get those document types set up, and then get the um, rules and regulations around the retention of those document types so that you can either keep them because you need to or get rid of them because you're allowed to based on your policy. Yeah, and, and Jen, what you're saying ties back to what Mark was saying too, that uh, uh, records might not necessarily be just documents, they can be physical items, but yeah, don't neglect the email side of things. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and, and all of that stuff is so easy to find these days. It, it, it just becomes exponential when you know, it comes down to what actually can be found so easily with software these days. So you want to really make sure that you've got the metadata on everything, that you've got a strong policy, and that you're you know, following your policies as far as the retention. So you're getting rid of things if you can. <laughs> Um, I want to direct this next question over to Mark, and um, someone had asked the questions, how are you incorporating maximum retention requirements of things like GDPR or uh, the CCPA, California Privacy Act, um, into traditional records retention schedules that define minimums, um, especially when the regulatory minimums coexist with maximums on certain types of records? That is a wonderful question. <clears throat> Um, gold star on the question. Neither GDPR nor California Consumer Privacy Act specifies retention periods for personal data. However, uh, I think it's GDPR Article 5 says that personal data should be kept uh, in a form which permits and it should be no longer than necessary for the purposes. So um, this goes back to the question, if you, you need to have, what we're seeing is organizations including in their records retention schedule, the, the having an up-to-date records retention schedule and using that for the retention of personal data. Because um, if it's a record, you have a requirement and, and those requirements uh, require you to be able to keep that. Um, so we don't, we don't necessarily, I think it's a bit of a trick question. A records retention schedule says this is how long we're gonna keep it. A records retention, most records retention schedules have a minimum we're seeing organizations not necessarily change you to a maximum, but to an actual period of how you want to keep it and when you want to get rid of it. For California Consumer Privacy Act, um, you sort of have the same thing. You know, for example, if somebody, you know, wants, if a if California uh, consumer want, or, or employee or resident comes and says, hey, I want you to, you know, delete this data about me, if you have a record keeping requirement to keep it, that record keeping requirement uh, will supersede the consumer's request um, to be able to delete it. And so, Again, this goes back to having a, a, an effective policy and schedule. Um, so again, the answer is neither CCPA or GDPR does specify a retention period, but it does justify the retention of something. And we're not seeing, most of the retention schedules have often been a minimum. What we're seeing is, is moving away from not, not, not a minimum or maximum, but here's a retention period, and then getting rid of it to be able to delete it is what we see. Um, we have a couple white papers on CCPA. If you email us at info at contour, same address, info at contour.com and ask for the CCPA white papers. Uh, I, I, think, I think California Consumer Privacy Act and the follow-on laws that are coming from other states will be the most impactful thing on compliance for companies since Sarbanes-Oxley. So if you're an information governance professional, I think it's critical that you understand the impact of this legislation. Um, and, and records management has a big part of it. And again, info.contaro.com, and we'll be happy to give you white papers and so, uh, but great question, thank you. Um, this next question, I wanna start with Jen, and certainly Mark, please chime in on this, because um, someone's asking the very important question, you know, essentially of you know, where do they start? You know, what are the most important initial steps for setting up an information governance initiative um, within an organization? Um, so Jen, can I, I can start. start. I know that. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I think that the most important thing to start with is creating a focus group within your organization and identifying which departments within your organization have 
interest and have needs for information governance. So typically, um, you know, legal will be involved, IT should be involved, records management should be involved, because those are all the parties these days that have the vested interest and are going to have to be involved in making the decision on what's best for the company. So I think the first step is figuring out who needs to be involved and then getting them all on the same page and getting them talking. And then once you've got that figured out, kind of taking a look at the, the steps that I mentioned, doing that gap analysis, bringing in the right team members to make sure that you have the information and the expertise that you need. If your legal team isn't sure, then there's no harm in bringing in an, you know, an exterior consultant and making sure you get an expert who understands how to manage this, what laws and regulations make sense, and then from there figuring out what makes sense for your company, bringing in the additional technology and all of that. But really the first step is figuring out who needs to be involved and then getting them talking because dynamic discussion, I think, is going to uncover a lot of issues that the other organizational team members don't understand, but it's going to bring all of the information that you need to the forefront and get you on the right track. I'm, uh, this is Mark. I'm going to agree with that, Jen. I'm going to say as part of that one, first step of bringing everybody together, make sure you can communicate what's the win for them. Um, and the win often should include the business units, and there's huge productivity gains with including the business units, but make sure you can do that. The next step is, is creating that roadmap of what you want to do. Oftentimes you want a big picture view. Are we talking about a couple projects or a multi-year effort? By the way, most of the times these end up being multi-year efforts. What are the resources involved? What's the technology involved? Uh, what's the time frame? What, what are the quick wins we can get? And then the other really important part in terms of getting started and this is very subtle, but we do, we, do a lot of, we do a lot of assessments and roadmaps, an awful lot, is identifying the target maturity for your organization. Um, and I've talked about this in the past. Do you need, you know, we've seen organizations, I've got one client that's got more than 100,000 employees, financial services, um, operations in 60 com countries, huge, you know, information governance risk and profile. Um, they need a really a, what I'll call a Cadillac program. We also, I deal with, you know, a small manufacturer that's got 300 people, uh, quite frankly, fairly low litigation and very low regulatory profile. They may be able to get away with a bicycle. So the key question you need to ask early in the question is, do we need a bicycle? Do we need a golf cart? Do we need a Chevy or do we need a Cadillac? And then helping understand what's the right level of maturity, and it can vary on different parts of the program for your organization. By the way, a lot of times getting a good Chevy you know, there's air in the tire, there's gas in the tank, um, this thing works, is going to be, be much more important than having, for example, a really super fancy sports car level of maturity where the sports car is always in the repair shop. And so understanding your target maturity and then expressing that in the plan and then communicating that to senior management to say, hey, we're not going for swinging for the fences, but we also want to make sure that we can meet our requirements and we think this is the right fit for us. I can't tell you how important that is to actually starting an, an information governance program. Thank you. Some really good helpful analogies there. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one last question here. And someone is asking, um, and so Jen, this is directed to you, um, you know, does Access offer out-of-the-box solutions you know, for records classification, inventory, process management, all those Wonderful necessary things. Can you just talk a little bit yeah, about, we, we, bri briefly about your product offering? Yeah, we absolutely do. And, and um, I'm sure we'll get a list of, of everybody who submitted the question, so I can um, definitely reach out directly and, and discuss it in more detail. But, yes, we do have um, some platforms, and I don't want to get to too much specifics here, but um, we've got specific solutions for HR and for accounts payable, but we also have ways to customize the platform to um, – there are preloaded document types, there are, you know, ways to auto-calculate retention and things like that. So it all comes down to making sure that the client has the correct metadata because if the metadata is correct, then it's really easy to, to, to apply the software to it. But if the data isn't good, it, it's really garbage in, garbage out. So we want to make sure that um, step one is getting that data clean, and we have the solutions and the services to do that as well. But I just want to be really clear that the metadata has to be good for any of this to work properly and for it to be legally defensible. But, um, yes, we do have the solutions to do that, um, and, and we can definitely assist. 
And, and yes, Jen, I will be sure that the list of all of the questions that, we've asked, that people have asked, because I know we haven't gotten to all of them, uh, will be sent over to you and your team to follow up with everyone. So um, thanks for that. Just want to touch okay. on a couple last things here be before we end our event today. Um, because we have been listening to Mark Diamond of Contoral and Jen Farnham of Access. Um, join us in San Diego for AIM's annual conference. It's coming up in March of 2019, and that's only four months away. I can't believe it's just around the corner here. And last year's conference sold out, and so I encourage you to go to our uh, website at aimconference.com, check out what's being planned, get some more information, register, and just secure your spot. So uh, I look forward to seeing you um, in San Diego. Also, um, AIM's next virtual event is next week on Thursday, December 6th, and it starts at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we're going to have a great lineup of speakers, and many of them are Microsoft MVPs because they're going to uh, we're all coming together to discuss governing your information and processes, specifically in Office 365 and all that that has to offer. So to learn more and to register, um, just click on the link that's in the resources area, um, or if you go to the AIM website under events to the virtual event, you'll be able to register for our event that's next week. And just as we are at the end of our webinar time, just to remind you we have recorded things. We will send everybody the link to the replay so you can listen to it again, invite your colleagues to listen to it. Please download the resources, take our survey. And I very much want to thank our underwriter access. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM would not be able to bring you our free educational programs like our webinars. So thank you, access. And just as we bring our webinar to a close, I just want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thoughts or a key takeaway. So um, let me start first with Mark Diamond from Contoro. Your closing thoughts today. Well, just, just um, what I'm going to say is that we're seeing a number of organizations that are expanding their records program to be a larger information governance program. And again, not too soon. Uh, GDPR had a, I'll say, a limited impact on U.S. companies probably a whole tap topic for another webinar, or, or at least activity on that. We think some of the new privacy regulations coming out there, uh, e-discovery, other things like that are coming up. Uh, fundamental to that is a modern compliant records retention schedule. Um, but with that, you can do a whole lot of good and, and cure a whole lot of ills with a single information governance program. But to do that, take a step back, sort of rethink how you're doing it, and, and be smart about it. Thank you, Mark. And Jen Farnham from Access, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, Mark pretty much took the words right out of my mouth. I, I, I'm actually very excited because I feel like in, in the space that I've been working in for the last decade, I can't believe it, um, this has been such a buzzword, but now I really feel like it's, it's something that is becoming tangible and, and people are really focusing on. So for me, it's exciting to see the progression. And I think, you know, as Mark said, that the timing is definitely right with all the software and the regulations that keep coming out every year. It's so important that you get a hold of what you're doing, take a look at what you're doing. Um, chances are you're doing a better job than you think. And it's not, you know, always as scary um, or as daunting a task as you think it might be, but you really need to understand where you're starting and where you want to go. And I think if you can get a good roadmap planned out, it becomes a little bit easier to accomplish those step-by-step -step goals. And once you start moving down the road, as long as you're partnering with the right companies and you've got the right people invested in it, you're going to be successful. So I just think, um, you know, as Mark said, take a step back, take a look at what you're doing currently and assess that and then kind of develop where you want to go from there. And I think if you create a good plan and you have, you know, good tasks that make sense and you've got everybody involved, you're going to have a good outcome. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, for AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you with our next event. And have a good afternoon.